When we were younger, we all played that game in the playground of who can name the biggest number. Now, if you were normal, then you probably said something like a billion or a trillion. And if you were a big nerd like me, then you might have said a Google, which is 10 to the power of 100, or a Google Plex, which is 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 100. But did you know that to this day, there are still some adults who play this game and know they don't have anything better to do? The study of big numbers is creatively named Googleology, but it turns out that a Google is actually not thing compared to the numbers we're going to be talking about today. The numbers in this video are going to get so big that it will blow your socks off, starting with level one, Graham's number. Three plus three equals six. Pretty big, right? Well, three times three equals nine. That's even bigger. And three to the power three equals 27. But what if we wanted to go even bigger? Well, let's denote three to the power three using arrows. So three arrow three equals 27. Now this is just three times three times three. So it's the previous operation repeated three times. So we can define the next operation as three arrow arrow three, which is three arrow three arrow three repeated three times and this is three to the power three to the power three which is three to the power 27 which is 7.6 trillion already getting massive numbers now what about three arrow 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 three now this is three arrow arrow three repeated three times but we do the last part first so the uh, three arrow arrow three is 7.6 trillion so this becomes three arrow arrow 7.6 trillion okay and then this is a power tower of threes 7.6 trillion times so it's a massive power tower okay and you can't even imagine how big this is this is just ridiculous and if we go one step higher we get three arrow 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 three which is g1 so if g1 is three up 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 three then you might think that g2 is three up with five arrows and then a three but it's actually not it's actually more than this it's actually three with g1 number of arrows so a ridiculously unimaginably large number of arrows followed by a three and that makes G2. And so G3 is three followed by G2 number of arrows followed by a three, which is even more on an unimaginably large. And Graham's number, which is sometimes known as G, big G, is G64. It just is, okay? It's just, it's just the 64th iteration of this, which is basically infinity it might as well be infinity okay so these are the rules we've got a up b equals a to the power b a up to the n of b which is n many arrows is equal to a up n minus one a up n minus one all stretched out b times a up b up c is equal to a to the power b to the power c in brackets because this actually gives us bigger numbers than this and those two things are not the same and g1 is three up to the four of three g to gn is three up to the g of n minus one so gn minus one many arrows followed by a three and then big g which is graham's number is g64 this let me remind you is only level one level two conway's chained arrow notation this notation helps us to get even bigger numbers using slightly different rules the rules are a arrow b equals a to the b which is same as before a arrow b arrow one is a arrow b so we just ignore the ones on the end a arrow one arrow c is just a so we ignore the one and we ignore everything after it a arrow b arrow c is a arrow a arrow b minus one arrow c arrow c minus one this will make sense in a minute but this is basically the unique part of this and five is a arrow b arrow c arrow d is a arrow b arrow c arrow d with the last part done first so for example two arrow three arrow two gives us using this rule up in the corner two arrow two arrow three minus one arrow two arrow two minus one which evaluates down to two arrow two arrow two arrow two arrow one arrow one can be ignored because it 
arrow ones are ignored. And then we've got two arrow, two arrow, two arrow, two minus one is one. So that can be ignored along with the number after it. And two minus one here can also be ignored. So we end up basically with just two arrow, two arrow, two. And now that we've got these brackets here, we can evaluate this first is just two. Two arrow two is four. So then we get two arrow four, which is two to the power four, which is 16. Not very big, right? But it's in the four chain numbers, which is where we start to see crazy growth. For example, two arrow three arrow two arrow three. If we evaluate this, we get two arrow three arrow two arrow three. So two, three arrow two arrow three gives us three arrow two arrow three is this using this rule up at the top which gives us three arrow, three arrow, one arrow, two arrow, one. The ones can be ignored along with anything after it. So we get three arrow, three arrow, two. And this, using the rule at the top again, we get three arrow, three arrow, three minus one arrow, two arrow, two minus one. This two minus one can be ignored because of the one at the end. And then three arrow, two arrow, two gives us three arrow, two arrow, two gives us this, which is 27. And so we can replace this with 27, which is three to the power 27, which is 7.6 trillion. And then we can replace this up here with 7.6 trillion. So we end up with two to the power 7.6 trillion, which is just unbelievably massive. Level three, Stanghouse Moser. Okay, so we define three triangle as just three to the power three, which is 27. And three square, which is the next level up, is three wrapped in three triangles, which if we try to evaluate this, well, three triangle is just 27. So we've got 27 wrapped in two triangles. Now, 27 triangle is gonna be 27 to the power 27. That's still got one triangle around it. So this is gonna be 27 to the power 27, which is already huge, wrapped, sorry, to the power of 27 to the power 27. So this is just astronomically large. Now I want you to imagine two inside of a pentagon. This is two inside of two squares. Now two square is gonna be two with two triangles around it wrapped in a square, which is gonna be two with two triangles around it wrapped in two, 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 two triangle, many triangles. So basically it's just gonna be a ridiculous number of triangles, like unimaginably large number of triangles and then evaluate that, okay? It's gonna be huge. Now two wrapped in a pentagon is called a mega and it's already mega big. Now imagine two wrapped in some kind of polygon with mega number of sides, okay? You can call this a megagon. Okay, and to evaluate this, well, you'd have to start with two with a mega minus one number, sorry, a mega minus one gone, which is still a huge, huge number, mega number of times, which basically this is just, you, you can't even imagine it. Now this, level four, the tree function. To understand the tree function, we've got to play a game. Let's say we have three different colored nodes and using these nodes, we've got to create a forest full of trees. The first rule is tree one cannot have more than one node, tree two cannot have more than two nodes and so on. So in general, tree N contains at most N nodes. The second rule is you can't build a tree which contains a previous tree. A tree can contains another tree if the nodes share the same nearest common ancestor. So for example, we've got the green and the blue share the red ancestor. So this tree is contained in this bigger tree because they still share the same common ancestor. And the same here, the blue and the red share the same common ancestor green and the same common ancestor green is still here. So this tree is actually contained in this tree. But in this example here, the green and the blue share the same common ancestor red, but they don't share the same common ancestor here because this is blue, which is not the same. So this tree is not contained in this tree. Tree of N is the max possible number of trees that you can create with N different colors of nodes. So to try and find tree of one, well, we just start playing this game with one single colored node but because we only have one color, we can't make another tree without breaking the rule because then it just contains itself. So the answer is tree one equals one. Tree two, we have two colors, red and green, and this is the maximum number of trees we can make without breaking these two rules. So tree two equals three, because there are three trees. But what about tree three? The number of trees you can plant with three nodes, just three different colored nodes, 
is bigger than Graham's number, but it's not infinity. And tree four also is bigger than that, but it's still not infinity. Level five, the sigma function. A Turing machine is a hypothetical tiny little computer that starts with a never ending string of zeros and depending on its state and what it's pointing at, either moves right or left, overwrites it with a zero or a one and then changes states. So for example, if I have a Turing machine with two states, A and B, it's only ever gonna read either zero or one. So let's say if it's on A and it reads a zero, it's going to overwrite with a one, it's going to move to the left and then switch to state B. And then let's say if it's on B and it reads a zero, it's going to change it to a one, uh, move to the left and then switch to state H, which stands for halt, which halts the machine. Okay, and then let's just say um, one L B. So same same function for one and same here one L H. Okay, now let's see what happens. All right, so we run the Turing machine. First, it's on A and it reads a zero, so it overwrites the zero with a one. Then it moves to the left, moves to the left, and it changes to state B. Now it's in state B and it reads a zero, so it's this one here, it changes it to a one. It moves to the left again, so now it's over here. Ah! Now it's over here. Uh, and it changes to state H, which means halt, so it stops on here. So now we've just got basically two ones and the rest is still zeros. So that's all this machine does. So that was just a Turing machine with two different states. But for the busy beaver function, we consider a Turing machine using sigma of n with n possible different states. So for example, sigma of two would be all the possible ways of writing any of these values in for two possible states. So that was just a Turing machine with two possible states, A and B. But for the busy beaver function, we consider sigma of two by considering all possible different combinations of numbers or letters that could go in here to create some kind of program. So the sigma of n is the maximum number of possible ones that can be written by a machine with n possible states. So I just showed you how a machine with two possible states can write two ones, but there's actually a machine out there that can make four ones with only two possible states, A and B. So sigma of two, the maximum is gonna be four. Sigma of one, is just one. So sigma one is one, sigma two is four, sigma three is six, sigma four is 13, and it looks pretty normal until we get to sigma five, which is 4,096, and then sigma six is 10 up, up 15 using Nuth's up arrow notation, which means a power tower of tens 15 times. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Sure, that is pretty fast, but surely tree is faster, right? Because this doesn't even get close to Graham's number. Well, yes and no, because while the tree function does appear to grow a lot faster than the busy beaver function at first, for any large enough power of n, the busy beaver function will vastly outgrow any other computable function possible because it's a non-computable function, okay? Meaning that you have to actually run this busy beaver machine in order to find out what the max number is. There's no possible function that computes it. And because tree of n is technically computable, although we don't have powerful enough computers to actually do it, and because tree of n is technically computable, although we don't have large enough supercomputers that can actually do it, the busy beaver function is larger than the tree function for large enough power of n. For example, the busy beaver of a Google is going to be way bigger than tree three. Level six, the Xi function. The SKI calculus program is a binary tree where, which is just a tree where each of the nodes can have up to two children. So for example, like this, where each of the leaf nodes contain one of the three operations S, K, or I. You can reduce any program using the following three rules. I of X is just X, K of trees X and Y gives us just X, so we remove the Y. And the S of X, Y, and Z, where X, Y, and Z are trees, because remember we're reducing trees down, is 
xz bracket yz. The tree stops when something breaks the algorithm. So for example, if we just see k of x, then we can't do k of x because k works for only two functions, but we've only got one here. So the algorithm just stops. Some SKI expressions just reduce to a single i, some reduce to another small value, and some just keep going on and on and on forever. If an SKI expression reduces to a string of n operations, we say that the expression has an output size of n. SKI calculus alone is no more powerful than a Turing machine, unless if we add another symbol omega, where omega x, y, Z equals Y if X reduces to I or Z otherwise. If we start with a string of N symbols and we reduce it, then the largest possible finite output size is called Xi of N. Xi of one is one, Xi of two is two, Xi of three is three, Xi of four is four, Xi of five is six, Xi of six is 17, Xi of seven is 51. It doesn't look very scary, right? But Xi of 30 is bigger than G, which is Graham's number. This number also grows larger and faster than the Bibi Beaver function for large enough values of n because it's also non computable. Ryle's number in plain English is the smallest number that is bigger than any number you can define using n number of symbols in a formal mathematical language. Now, I know what you're thinking. Surely that's cheating, right? Because I could just name any number or oh, the biggest number that you could ever think of in the world, in the universe, and then name it after myself, and then boom, I've got the biggest number. But it's actually not cheating, and I'll explain why. Ryle's number does have a formal mathematical definition, which is on screen now. This is the largest currently known, well-defined number that's not infinity, and it's way bigger than even the biggest, baddest monster that you can create using all the previous functions combined, because all the previous functions can be defined in first order set theory. Ryle's number is just this function where n is a Google. So if you've got a Google symbols, what's the biggest thing you can create with it? Now there is technically a slightly bigger theoretical number called Bigfoot, where foot of n is the largest possible uh, number you can define using nth order set theory, but this I've not included as the largest number because it's ill-defined, meaning there's no mathematical equation like this. I can't show you something that says this is foot. So until then, Bigfoot's just still a theory, and like, comment, subscribe, click on this video if you want to see more, and piss off.